exciting. Oh, I love that music. And I just want to thank y'all. That, uh, you know, when people cheer and it's not officially Pastor Appreciation Sunday, it's just like, what? Thank you. That and I just, I was already, I had tears in my eyes over the announcements long before that because I love all those humans. And um, I just get, well, you know what, Linda, the funniest thing, I was up here messing around with my pages and I missed Esther. So I just want to share, that was my granddaughter, for those of you that didn't know, that jumped up in the shot, which I think is going to be a theme in her life. But, uh, but I even missed that moment. I knew I'd heard about it, and I was looked away, and I missed the moment, which that's also a theme in her life. Um, but I just got tears in my eyes because, you know, when people will come out, hang out together, just for the sake of making announcement videos to gather the body and rally the body. You know, something's going on. And Paul and I have always said it's not just about what goes forth from the platform. It's about your receptivity. So without you, there's no Abbey. And we are the Abbey together. And so thank you. And, um, and we just appreciate that. They gave me a long list of what would be on the announcement video, but they secretly left that one off. So I did not know about that. So you can go ahead and put my slide up. Uh, there we go. And we are continuing on this series, Abiding, as you well know. And I just want to, I threw this in. This is just a little warm-up slide. Um, oh, by the way, I just want to share, uh, man, that time with the Lord was really intense and personal. But this is goofy. I just want you to know I own these shoes and I was looking so cute in them. And um, I was standing over there worshiping. Cute, right? Like, see that Western Texas? It looks like a Texas, like a UT professor. That's my current trending look. And I was standing over there, and I brought these shoes, which are also UT professor-like. And I turned around to my friend Donna, and I said, should I go for like suave style or comfort and she goes uh. <laughs> that was that yeah 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 so I just want you to know that I was cute <laughs> for 20 minutes and now I'm I chose comfort which means I chose fun You're cute oh Paul <laughs> eh. Enneagram 5, I don't do that. Eh. Thank you, though. I love you dearly uh, on, a, on a deep level that transcends cuteness. Okay, so this is just a warm-up slide, y'all. We've been talking about abiding, and it, thought, and it made me think about the fact that, you know, we use that phrase, my humble abode. So an abode is a place you abide. And this is just a little simple thought, but kind of summarize how do you abide in a house? Because we're... We're talking about abiding in him, right? Abiding in his presence, abiding in his truth. Can I just say, you really can't abide in religion. It'll kick you out on the doorstep. But you can abide in him because he's welcoming. So a couple of points of how you abide. Again, this is a warm-up slide. Don't try to think yet. Just come along for the ride. Um, number one, how do you abide in the house? You keep returning there. And you know, when you move to a new house, we have done this before. When we first moved to our new house, we would turn and go the wrong way home from the gym because we forgot we'd moved. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do that in Christianity. Sometimes when you're learning new ways of loving and living, you accidentally turn and go toward Azel when you move to Eagle Ranch, right? I don't mean Azel's the bad part. That wasn't... No, don't, that wasn't a good analogy. That was just where we used to live is all. <laughs> Truly. <clears throat> Number two, you adopt it as your new address. You have to change your address on some things, right? You have, to, you have to actually say, I'm sorry, I don't receive mail at that address anymore. And sometimes you have to say, I don't want to receive that mail anymore. Then you go from room to room exploring the space. Well, <laughs> That, I, that probably wouldn't be on the list except, gosh, almost a year ago, where is the time gone, when Paul and I had COVID, and of course, we had to abide in our house, 
uh, I spent my time going from room to room. So I would camp out in one room for four hours and then move myself to another room and camp out there for four more hours with my laptop, lying down, watching <laughs> YouTube documentaries. Paul was reading theological books. I was watching YouTube documentaries. You go from room to room exploring the space. Then you shelter and take refuge there. Hey, you might raise a family there. You know, you should raise your family abiding in his presence, not in religion. Um, you set up shop from there. You let it be home. Some people cook there. I didn't put that on my list. Um, <laughs> you incorporate, yet again this week, I, I tried for the 300th time to be an amazing cook, and yet again I thought, I praise God for those who are. Now, you let it be home, and then finally the summary of them all is you incorporate it into your lifestyle. That's pretty much how you abide in a place, isn't it? Now, two, uh, last week, no, two weeks ago, I talked to you about the shadow. We had Carl Young on a Sunday morning, um, and I talked to you about the fact, like, it's basically here in Psalm 51, 6, where David said to the Lord, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. It's not secret to him, it's secret to us and everybody else. But it's not scary. It's that God wants to meet you there because 90% of what you put in shadow is pure gold. You just got hurt, so you hit it. And the other 10% is already dealt with at the cross. So the sum total of that week, go back and find it if you're interested, is that we as a body are coming out of shame. And then last week, Paul introduced the term gnarly to you. And a bunch of us, because he said these gnarly old vines had the sweetest, most concentrated fruit, less fruit, but more concentrated. And so Gene Spradlin and I this week, we were like, we're just gnarly old vines, aren't we? Like, <laughs> if you're mature in the Lord, if you've seen a few things come and go, but you're still passionate about him, you qualify as a gnarly vine. But I don't know about you, I'm a culture, I'm a culture vulture, and so the whole time Paul was talking, all I could think about was surfer culture. Am I the only one? Gnarly man, gnarly dude. Like, I, uh, yeah, thank you, but shaka people and all that stuff. And so I, he didn't mention it. And so that's all I could think of. And so I looked it up, and it's, it's a thing. In the 1960s, I think it arose, um, surf punks, and this is from an Internet article, Surf punks use gnarly to refer to any wave over two feet. Still, you may also refer to a man or woman of great, <coughs> excuse me, of great importance as your gnarliness. <coughs> How funny is that? Wave riders have been using it for decades. When the swell is pumping and surfers are shredding out the back, then we know something gnarly is taking place. Hey, this sounds like a lot more fun Christianity than some people have advertised. <laughs> right away. The expression often comes out of a surfer's mouth when something simultaneously spectacular and unexpected occurs. So, instead of saying, you're a gnarly old vine, Cheryl, I'm going to say, you're gnarliness. <laughs> Y'all like that? And you can be young and gnarly. You don't have to be old. What it means is you've spent time in the presence of God to go deeper than just the surface. We'll leave it at that. Isn't that cool? There's some other cool stuff uh, on here. It also, it, it describes something or someone, awesome, cool, excellent, wonderful, amazing, radical, incredible, tough, great, Intense, extreme, or fantastic. Gnarly, dude. <laughs> See, it's not cheesy if it's real. <laughs> That's my motto. All right, so today we're going to focus in on one scripture. You know, John 15 is the abiding chapter, and we're going to focus in on one verse that we haven't really focused in on, and that is verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask 
what you desire and it shall be done for you. And on the left, you have the proverbial grapes that show up in every abiding scripture graphic. But on the right, isn't that interesting? I love that picture because it's a matter of perspective. And sometimes you, you could never, you know, sometimes your problem seems so big you're trying to catch the sun. But you know what? In terms of perspective, when his words abide in you, the creator of the sun lives in you and things look smaller, don't they? In the spirit, that's the view we need. So here it is. You're coming to expect that we are very much in love with the Passion Translation. And so here it is in the Passion Translation. But if you live in life union with me, that's a good summary of abiding. I think Paul shared that last week. And if, and if my words live powerfully within you. So remember the, the King james -y normally version said, if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Same thing here. But he calls it life union with me. And if my words live powerfully within you, I submit to you that means life union with my words too. But we'll go deeper into that. Then you can ask whatever you desire and it will be done. The hint there, oops, don't touch the microphone, Karen. The hint there is that what you desire is not going to be wacko if you've been abiding in him. Because abiding in him in life union creates his desires within you. And I don't just mean the desires for holiness. Sure that. But the desire for success, for fun, for adventure, for coloring outside the lines, for whatever it is your life is supposed to be marked out about. So, a couple of footnotes in the Greek. The word, it, word there is rhema. My words live powerfully in you. It means the spoken words, but we're going to say a bunch more about that. And then the second one, the Aramaic is translated, my words take hold or are strong within you. So that means I didn't sit my body on a seat and let the words wash over me, but my, your words took hold in me. That never happens solely on a Sunday morning. That happens somehow outside. It's coming on a Sunday morning is like having the menu read to you. We hope, we pray, we're doing our best, but you order, you eat, you nourish yourselves. That's Christianity. We want to be the best help we can, but there's an abiding responsibility on everybody. So there's two valid ways to look at this. Number one, Jesus, who is the Logos, remember he's the Word incarnate, we'll say some more about that, he equates himself with his words. Do you see that? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, do you see that there's a heavenly equation in there that he's giving you a hint? You don't have to just go, where are you, Jesus? Are you in me? Like, I want to, there's some words that you can partake of. You're not happy yet, but we've got 30 minutes before we decide if you're happy in the end. I, bl I bet you get happy. <laughs> Number two, Jesus is saying that living in union with him will make his words come alive inside you. Okay. His words are self-manifesting like DNA. So, I'm going to help you if you think, oh, no, she's going to preach at me about getting in the word. So, let's start by being honest. We mostly, hint, evidence, I mean, underlining on mostly, we mostly don't get excited if he sends us to a book. I might. A few of you might. There are some geeks among us who would go, thank you, you gave me a book. Who here went to college in the day that you bought your textbook, they weren't online yet, and you loved the smell of the bookstore, and you came home with your very heavy textbooks? I loved them. I love the smell, and I just thought, you have given me Leninger's biochemistry. Thank you. <laughs> when my professor is incomprehensible, and he was, I had a book, and I could go home to my dorm room, and I could go, that's what he meant. And I became one with Leninger's biochemistry. I did. <laughs> and once... Early in the semester, my professor drew the wrong amino acid when he was lecturing. He drew threonine, and it was supposed to be alanine. 
and I just raised my little hand and I said, um, sir, I think you have drawn threonine. And he, I thought, everybody went, oh no, she corrected the professor. But see, I'd spent time with the book. <laughs> and he said, oh, you're right. I'm so glad someone was listening. He was mean too. So it was like, I was like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Because that stuff doesn't pay off much. Usually I was just hiding it in the corner like I've read the whole chapter. <laughs> okay. One, one time that professor, he put, by, he put the way he did a dot matrix of scores is he, he just did dots. So whatever exam we had, big test we had in biochem, he just put a dot, but he didn't label it. So it was just a hand-drawn. I mean, y'all, I'm old. It's pre-computers. Anyway. We all would go. He had like a number so you could find your number, but nobody knew your number, right? So you could see your... No, he didn't even do that. It was just the distribution. That's right. Anyway, so I knew what I made on the test. But when I looked at the thing, my score was way off by itself, you know? And the little group of students that was standing there was going, who is that person? Who is that? We're going to kill him. And I was going... <laughs> But then I was kind of going, oh, oh. It was very confusing. So, <laughs> but when it came to God, I literally did this. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then I went, oh, there's a textbook. But I, something about my attitude toward it, I didn't, I didn't, I, I just thought, this is the God of the universe. I've just come alive to him. He is like, whoa, like I'd felt his power, been impacted and encountered him. So there's no way that book could be boring. So I just stared and interacted and looked up words and found out he did send us a book, but it's a living book. And so today I feel like I'm uniquely anointed to give you the commercial for, look, it's a, it's a textbook of science in the spirit, if you will. But I know some of you don't even like that, so just, we'll move on. Okay. In fact, this is how it looked to me. How about that? There's a million cute graphics, and I've used them, of Bibles with, like, fireworks coming out. But I saw this this week, and I went, that. Because the universe made sense when I looked in the book that the Son of God died to make real for me. Don't forget that. Resurrected to put in my heart. And the next picture, listen, again, nothing's cheesy if it's real. The next picture is borderline cheesy, but this is everything. How do you get to this? Look at that. Thank you, those of you that are doing that, because that's what I did. I went, oh. <sighs> so there I was, pretty much that age, in my college dorm room, Baptized in the Holy Ghost, I would put aside Leninger's biochemistry and I would pick up my Bible and it would be like, whoa, whoa, he would breathe. He would breathe. That's how I got to know him because I was book oriented. But what I'm trying to tell you, it's not just for those of us that are book oriented. He's the living word. And then guess what else? Side effect, I went back to Leninger. I don't even know if I can tell you all this. It's privileged information. He breathed on Leninger sometimes. He'll breathe on whatever he created. Romans 1. So there's a key. Here's the key. Let the, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is Colossians 3.16. And the word richly means abundantly, fully resourced, rich. I love this phrase right in the middle there. Having God's muchness. He's God. He's got all the things. Do you know God? I don't know. I never thought about this before. God knows all about cryptocurrency. That thought just occurred to me. I don't even much care. But if you care, he knows all about it. He knows all about everything. The word of... No, it doesn't say in the Bible, read here for cryptocurrency instructions. But if you get to know his wisdom... If you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and the phrase right after that that's not on this slide says, in all wisdom. 
dwell means inhabit as one's personal residence. So here's the goal, is letting him move into our house and shed his stuff. Now, we in immunology, Paul and I are from the realm of immunology. Our master's is in biochem and immunology. And so we knew the thing of shedding virus long before COVID. But now everybody knows that word. The virus sheds, right? Y'all have heard that now. It's all in pop culture. It's so funny. There's a bunch of words that were lab words that are now in pop culture. But can I tell you, the word of God sheds inside you. It sheds stuff. It sheds who he is. It sheds health. It sheds heaven. It sheds new perspective. It sheds wholeness. It sheds provision. It sheds. Jeremiah knew this enough to say, your words were found, one translation says, um, no, your words were found and I ate them. One translation says, I devoured them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. Very different from just staring at the book, isn't it? It's a completely different attitude. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I put a digestive system on the screen because I'm in control of the PowerPoint and it made me happy. (laughs) But also to tell you, your digestive system is a complicated, God-engineered system to extract nutrients of all kinds from your food. On my, ma- on my orals exam for my master's degree, there was one professor that always asked everybody, okay, you've just eaten a hamburger, trace every part of that burger through the entire digestive system. And I knew he was gonna ask, so I was prepared. And 15 minutes later, he was satisfied. The Point is, it's a big deal. Would God do that in the natural, but have no nutrients to extract from his food for you in the spirit? No, he would not. If that's true in the natural, how much more? And you don't even know about it, do you? Like right now, your body is extracting nutrients from whatever you've eaten recently, and you're not sitting there going, please do it right, I hope I'm getting it. (laughs) And yet spiritually, don't we do that? We go, I don't know if I felt that message. Can we have more faith in what God does in the spirit than we even do in the natural? Because the natural is given to us to build our faith in the spirit. Romans 1, 19 and 20 tells us that. The point is, there are nutrients. And here's a scripture. James 1, 21 says, here's another metaphor really. Receive with meekness the implanted word. The word there is logos. Like Jesus is called the logos in John 1, 1 through 3 and John 1, 14 which is able to save your souls. Anybody ever had a part of your soul, your mind, your will, or your emotions that's been a little hard to save? Right here, he's telling me that there's a kind of word, a kind of logos that's able, the word in the Greek is dunamis, powerful, to save my soul. But he adds that word, implanted. So it wasn't the word that just skimmed by me, that is powerful to save my soul. That's a beginning, but it's the word implanted. Another word for that, and here's an old cartoon that's beautiful, piece of art, is engrafted. The engrafted word is able to save your soul. And you can't read that, but up at the top it says, it is customary, as is well known, this is like from the 1920s, and I just love it, for the nurserymen to graft onto the stalk of a sour orange tree The scion, that means a pointy, what you see there, it's prepared to be grafted. It's a pointed shoot that's made to be grafted. Uh, Of a sweet orange tree, and the result is a fruitage of luscious sweet oranges. The graft bearing the fruit of the new tree, not the old. Now, when God's word comes into you, you're not a sour tree anymore. But how many of you know some of your circumstances still are a little sour? Can I just tell you today, speak the word of God into those, the logos of God into those circumstances, and the sweet stuff gets grafted into the sour, which reminded me of Exodus 15, 25, where Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they came to bitter water, and surprise, they complained to Moses, which they had a habit, 
And Moses turned to the Lord, which thankfully he had a habit of doing, and the Bible says the Lord showed him a tree, which when he throw, threw it into the water, it made the bitter water sweet. That is a picture of the cross, the logos, the work of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the logos on the cross being thrown into our circumstances. How do you throw the word in your circumstances? You commune with it till it comes out of your mouth and gets fired off into that circumstances, and it makes the bitter water sweet. The root word of engrafted means to puff up or germinate. Give the word time and room in your life to do so for the Holy Spirit to make it do so. How many of you had a child who brought home a little cup of soil that supposedly had a seed in the bottom of it from school? Right? They planted a seed in a, cu- in a Dixie cup of soil and they brought it home. I myself, after three times of that, was frustrated with how long it took. <laughs> right? But what lesson are they supposed to be learning? It's in there. Just because you can't see it, it's not real. The power of the seed takes some time in incubation. Yeah. Could we maybe apply that to our grown up spiritual lives? 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, And we thank God continually because when you receive the word, again, this is the logos, so the word here is not rhema, it's logos. We're going to say a little more about this. Which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but actually as it is the word of God, the logos of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Remember digestion. Could the word be at work in me and not feel it? Do you feel things being absorbed by your large intestine right now? Most of you know. The word work, it says here that the word of God is at work in you who believe. The word work is energeio, and it means working in a situation which brings it from one stage to the next, like an electrical current energizing a wire bringing it to a shining light. That's what the word of God is doing in you. What word? The word that you're engrafting into you. The word, we used to sing a very cheesy song based on that scripture back in the days when there was not a lot of an amazing music and worship like there is today. And we had a little song that said, oh man, <laughs> it's embarrassing. The word is working mightily in me. The word is working mightily in me. No matter what the circumstances, what I feel or see, the word is working mightily in me. Not a lot of creativity in that song. Not a lot of, you only, you it almost, you want a little oompa band to follow you around and (laughs) hold down. The word is working mightily in me. But, um, hey, 30 years later, I never forgot it. And did you catch that line? No matter what my circumstances, what I feel or see. Y'all, we put more, we get disappointed in the word quicker than we get disappointed in Tylenol. And that's not right, is it? I'm not down on us. I'm just laughing at us. Because we have a brain, me included. Okay. So the last two scriptures we looked at used the Greek word logos for word. And the Greeks basically invented Western philosophy. And I love this definition. Philosophy is an unusually stubborn attempt to think clearly. Isn't that great? It's my favorite definition of philosophy. William James said that. Um, And they didn't want to think clearly just about, you know, dinner. They wanted to think clearly about the meaning and purpose of life. And I personally would like to start a movement where Christians tried to think a little more clearly. But that's another topic. I'll leave that. But I, I find redemptive keys all over Greek philosophy. Hey, That's what John did when he wrote the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because the Greeks had an answer. You know, 
What is the meaning of life? The Greeks had an answer. Who am I? Why am I here? The Greeks had an answer. Their answer was called logos. It was an impersonal force that meant the whole divine reason that made everything. The thing, they looked around and said, something made this. There's a, there's a whole wisdom. There's a whole divine reason out there. We're going to call it the Logos. And when John came along and began his book of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, in the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God and the Logos was God. John 1.14 the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, he said, hey, you Greeks, your search for meaning is not wrong. Come on, let's, have, let's more of us have a search for meaning. You found an answer, but your answer is impersonal. Let me introduce you to the answer as a person, capital P, the second member of the Trinity, the Son of God, the Logos, which, fast forward, the Logos died on the cross and was resurrected. What? The Greeks asked the question, made an answer. John came along and said, we're going to inhabit that answer with the truth of the Son of God. He is the divine reason. Can I just say, he didn't end the search. He anointed the search because he is the answer to the search. John's use of the word logos plays off a pre-existing Greek term while connecting it to a personal, unique, divine being. So the Greeks in the beginning basically said there was a logos, a, a divine reason, they said, we're going to investigate it. So while that was happening in Greece, in the East, what the Eastern religions were saying is, well, there's a divine vibration. There's a divine wavelength, a divine frequency. Om, there's that, right? And they said, we're going to imitate it. Okay? So the Greeks said, there's reason, and we're going to investigate it. The, the East said, the West said that. The East said, there's a sound, there's a vibration, and we're going to imitate it. The Old Testament says, in the beginning, God. The Old Testament says, in the beginning, God. But then the New Testament hones in on that and solves it all when it says in the beginning was the word which I submit to you combines the divine reason the sound is there sound in a word and God which is why I say to you that the logos is the frequency of the universe the Son of God resonates with the frequency of the universe because through him all things were created. But it's no accident that the Logos is the word because that means when I abide in him and that frequency gets strong in me and then I speak his truth, I'm also resonating with the frequency of the universe. Not in a weird out there ooh way, but in a get healed body way. Get happy, brain. Shake off depression, brain. Anybody ever need to resonate with their own brain? Hey, listen. We don't just need to do some weird thing out there. We need to do the things here and here in families, in hearts, in lives, in communities. And out there, the world matters, but this is not ooey-gooey. This is real. This is real. So... On this slide, I just went a little deeper. The first one says, God spoke the world into existence. Remember that the Holy Spirit hovered or fluttered. The word hovered in Genesis 1 means to make a vibration. It's a back and forth, binary motion. Colossians 1.17 says, In him, who's that? The Logos. All things hold together. I believe he's at the center of every atom. Therefore, the Logos, he's not invested in creation, but he's not, it resonates with his frequency. So this is not pantheism, not saying he is nature, just making that clear, but it is saying that, here's the way it is. God spoke the Logos, and it's so powerful, it just keeps vibrating. Jesus never 
dampens and runs out of energy in that vibration. Listen, there's radio waves still out in space from the 1950s because vibrations don't lose their power that quick, but even they will lose their power. But this one that God spoke is still vibrating. <sighs> hey. One time I was sitting, you know what resonance is? It's when two frequencies combine and they go. One time I was sitting, we were flying to England with a musician and we were sitting on the plane waiting to take off and I was telling him something I thought was fascinating. As I do, planes are great for me. You can't get away. <laughs> and I looked at him and he was going, uh, you know what he's doing? He had, he was finding the resonant frequency of the plane. Because you know how planes have a hum? And that's what he was doing while I was talking to him. He was like, ah, ah, there it is. And, <laughs> oh, but you know what? Your circumstance has a frequency. And God wants to hone you in on it. And that's actually, I never planned to use Ron Bailey humming as an example. But, but listen, when you abide in the word of God... At some point in there, he may be, you're hearing all these words. Maybe while I'm preaching today, maybe you're thinking, what are all those words she's saying? But something in you may go, uh, what if that's your circumstance? God's going, that's what you need. There you go. There's your thing. We're going to head into that next. Thank you. That's where we're headed for the rest of our, of our time together. Okay. So let me just say real quick, I want to refute a thing. I was sitting in a seminar once and a dude who was preaching who was mad a chick or a dude just means I'm temporarily mad at you that's all but I'll get over it so I'm calling him a dude he was a gnarly dude he was an otherwise dude and he <laughs> said um he was mad at the word of faith people and there were excesses I know but he goes the way you people the way those people treat the word of God I don't think he thought any were in there the way those people treat the word of God, he said, you'd think they're saying that there's a fourth member of the Trinity. That's what he said. He said, you'd think they're saying Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Word. And I was like, but he is the Word. Like, I, I literally thought, I, <laughs> I thought I should leave the room. I did not, but... Another time, I've, and I've heard this a lot, people say, Jesus isn't the book. He's, the book is just the roadmap to him. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to banish legalism, but please, there's no life in a roadmap. There's life in the book. And he is breathing on the book when I let him. So I do think he's not, the, the book is not in the Trinity, or is it? I'm going to leave you with that. Get me? It's like the difference in sequencing DNA and actually having DNA. On the left is a DNA sequence. There are machines. You could sequence your whole genome. Yay. It's awesome. It's great technology. It's fascinating. But if I give you that printout and go, here's everything you need to know, here's how much adenine, thionine, cytosine, and guanine you have, did I help you? No. You need an interpretation of that. But that's not what God does. He doesn't just hand us the sequence of the spiritual DNA we're supposed to have. No, that's law. He gives us the actual DNA. And he engrafts it into us and he implants it into us so it will grow. So I just want to say, and I'll do this quickly, because I'm a little angry, but I'll get over it by the next slide. There's a... There's a bunch of Christians running around showing the world the list of DNA right now. And they're yelling at them and saying, this is what you're going to have. <laughs> and that does not give them the DNA. But when the DNA gets in them, they'll produce whatever they're supposed to produce. And if they don't do it quick enough for my taste, it's not my business. Ha! <laughs> Thank you. I'm over it. Plus, I'm not always sure. No, I wasn't quite over it. I lied. I was 95%. Here's the last 5%. I'm not always sure the list of DNA analysis that some of these people are handing out is the correct one. 
But we'll move on. <laughs> Things could go wrong with that machine. Uh, is the Bible literal? It's more than that. It's spiritual. It's not just an explanation. It's living seed. <sighs> Legalism doesn't do a thing. Okay, but the time we have left... There are two Greek words for word. You've probably heard this before, but I want to bring a little close to today with, with some thoughts about this. Sometimes it's logos, sometimes it's rhema. And there's a great teaching that's helped a lot of people. Um, some great things Jack Hayford said about it back in the day. Um, and he's never hardly, I've never seen him be wrong. Um, it, but the oversimplification here is that the logos is the entire word of God, general, the big picture, and that the rhema is the specific bit made real in application. Okay? How many of you have heard that? A lot of you have probably heard that. That's been around a lot, and it's helpful. It's very helpful. We want a rhema word from God in our situation. Um, Jack Hayford said, Jesus is the living logos, which we just said a bunch in John 1.1. 1, 1. The Bible is the written logos, so the whole Bible, Hebrews 4.12. And the Holy Spirit utters the spoken logos. The meaning of rhema in distinction is illustrated in Ephesians 6, 17, which is where it talks about the sword of the Spirit. So when you're going to make bitter water sweet in a situation, you want a rhema. You want a word to stand on that is your sword put in your hand by the Holy Spirit. Now, it comes from the logos, but it's the Holy Spirit working in you to say, look right here. And whole other day... We'll talk about this sometime, but the Holy Spirit takes words out of context sometimes. Look out. The Apostle Paul did it in the New Testament. There's a great study to be had on that. Out of literal context. It's not out of spiritual context. Okay. Okay, I'll give you an example because you're looking at me like, what, really? There's a scripture in Proverbs that says the memory of the just is blessed. If you look the Hebrew up of that word, it means the legacy of the just. You'll have a good memory. People will remember you well. But if the Holy Spirit quickens that to you and says, hey, you can believe against dementia or old age with that, you know, the, your brain wearing out, that's in line with the Logos. So if the Holy Spirit says, grab that scripture and take it as a sword, and somebody goes, well, that's not what that means in the Hebrew. Say, too bad. <laughs> because it lines up. you gotta know the, you got to know both you got to know both. And people have been beating each other up with their interpretations too long. Okay, both Logos and Rhema are the Word of God. But Logos is God's Word objectively recorded in the Bible, while the latter is the Word of God spoken in a specific situation. However, you knew I was going to take it further. I want to go further. Some say written versus spoken. Logos, written, also Jesus versus pal spoken. I want to say that the Logos was indeed spoken when? At creation. So I want to say the Logos is not just written. That's where we're missing it. The Logos was spoken and still reverberating throughout the universe. So the Logos is the word that's spoken in the big picture creating. Let there be light. Let there be a Jonathan Medina. Let there be an abbey. Let there be a business. Logos. But when, when creation or Jonathan or the abbey or a business gets into trouble, there's a rhema for that situation. So the rhema is spoken in application. It's kind of like this. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and that word is rhema. So if I'm in a situation that the Logos birthed in me and I'm suddenly up against a wall and I go, I don't know where my faith is, that's when I need to expect the rhema. Because hearing, that's that hearing. Hearing comes by the specific sword put in your hand by the Spirit of God. It's all the same word. It's just living in two waves of it. Psalm 119, 130 says, The entrance or unfolding of your word gives light. Aha, now we get some help. Because what do we know about light? All of you know this about light. I know you do. Light 
is both a wave and a particle. So now the word of God, ah, a wave? What's a wave? It's all over the place, vibrating with the frequency of something. Logos is a wave. But the particle, the pal, that's the rhema. Light is both a wave or a particle depending on the situation. And it's kind of hard to predict when it's going to be which. You can sum, but it's still a mystery. And God's comparing his word to light. So sometimes it's a wave and sometimes it's a particle. So I've developed a terminology. You're going to love it. It's as good as gnarly. The wave, what you want to abide in, is the wave, the logos, okay? And that is the wow, the wow dot, dot, dot of the Word of God. Develop a relationship with the Word of God that you bathe in it, that you swim in it, that you expect it to be a bath. Jesus said, now you're clean from the words I've spoken to you. However... Know that as you do that, as you hang out in the, wow, you're going to have a pal. That's the rhema. The logos is working in you mightily. That was logos. Even when you don't feel it. You're hanging out with his words and you're refusing to let your mind make you think they're boring. But in the middle of that, keep on expecting that a bunch of those moments, there's swords being handed out. There's pals. The way I said it was, light can be a wave, wow, or a particle, pow, a photon that hits. That's what particles do. Abide in the logos, wow, and you are bound to have some rhema, pow. After a while, the pals dry up, if you're not abiding in the well. So if you're like, I haven't heard from God in a long time, go back and abide and quit demanding sensory stimulation. Some people are addicted to it. I understand, but I promise you this is a truth. Okay, here's, here's, we're bringing it to a close. The word abiding in you has a voice all its own. Look at Proverbs 6. 20 through 23. Oh, and by the way, that voice doesn't just speak literal scripture. It speaks lots of things. It speaks song lyrics sometimes. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake your mother, not your mother's teaching. Father, mother, father, son, Holy Spirit, word of the Lord, the law, the instruction, the truth. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you, part of how the word works in you. Even when you don't know you're being led, you are. When you lie down, they will watch over you. Thank God for that one. When you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Abiding in the word, communing with the scriptures, and letting them nourish your inner man over time, is the best way to tune and calibrate your inner hearing. I had on there your prophetic hearing. I chickened out and made it your inner hearing, and I have just regained my courage because I just want to say, listen, there's a lot of people that want to be a prophet, want to go around prophesying, but they haven't tuned in and fine-tuned and calibrated their inner hearing. Are you with me? Because you, you, the, the wow will calibrate your pal. And people, we pastored for over 30 years. We've seen people hurt, crushed, and sometimes even seemingly destroyed by prophetic words that were given mixed with solical or a desire to be important. Listen, it's a risk to prophesy always, but there's some basic ground rules and you're going to, you, if you don't know you need to calibrate your hearing on the inside, I love you dearly, but you're also dangerous. And I, Paul and I, the Abby, we want to help you. 
because it doesn't mean you don't have a gift. Here's, here's how I said it. I, I love this. This is how it came to me. Um, without abiding in him and calibrating, you don't have a prophetic ministry. You have a prophetic tendency. And it doesn't mean one day we reach perfection because then we wouldn't need the body to help judge. But all the... I'm so tired of trying to make rules. Like, oh, don't prophesy in private. Well, you hear in private. and yeah, I know we have to make all these rules, but it's cat herding. The real thing is this. When I change slides, I lose it, though. I lose the anger, so I'm moving on. <laughs> Not really anger. It's just I've been doing this. I want to protect people. I want to help. I want to help. I've seen some things. Okay, really, and, and I am bringing it to a close, and in just a minute, I'll call. Nope, I'm going to call for the worship team now. Because some of you need that hope, plus I need to see myself do that at 12.02. So the worship team may come. Here's what I want to say. I'm really telling you to have a life of meditation on the Word. 90% of meditation is simply getting interested. This is the burning bush that Moses saw in Exodus 3.3. And I always say, in Moses' condition of despair, he failed, he's been in the wilderness for years... He sees a burning bush that is on fire but not consumed. The bigger miracle is not that, because God does that. The bigger miracle is right here. I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. That implies Moses could have went, huh, and just kept going with his life. 90% of meditation is simply getting interested. You're meditating all day long, but you're meditating on your to-do list. 90% of meditation is building in the habit to see the burning bushes. Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. When you turn aside and see, look at this scripture. You get what I'm saying? Where, where's the pal? It's when you turn aside and choose the wow. Moses turned aside and he didn't have a guarantee. He didn't know what was happening. He was in despair. He thought his life was going nowhere at that point. He thought he'd failed his mission and purpose as a deliverer. But he saw a burning bush. Please realize we know now what that burning bush meant. He did not. He just made the right choice and said, I will now turn aside and see that's meditating. Is I, an, a hard attitude that says, Lord, the book, the Word of God, the Scriptures, I don't see it right now. It looks kind of boring, but I choose to turn aside and see. That's meditating. And look what happened when Moses did that. The next verse says, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, when he saw that Moses did that, God called him out of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Then the Lord said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. That was the ultimate coming alive of dry bones, because Moses' entire destiny lay in dry bones. But when he turned aside to see, pow! Not only did he get a complete reinstitution of his mission and purpose, but he got the he got holy ground. And I I dare say the victory was won then. If you are longing for the voice of God, turn aside and see. It's not like God's going, I'm gonna wait and see if they'll turn aside. Because that's not his heart or his attitude. It's that there's something that happens in the place of your inner man that can't happen in the place of your busy to-do list. And it doesn't take a hundred hours. I don't see that that took long. You develop a habit of it. You develop a trust of it. You go from room to room in the house of truth. Sometimes it's not in a room. What if you spent 10 minutes on a scripture and never thought, never felt a pal? 
still hung out with the, with the Logos, didn't you? And who are you to judge what the pal A has to feel like or timing? The word is working mightily in me. No matter what my circumstance, what I feel or see, the word is working mightily in me. You know, back in the Word of Faith day, when we sang that song, somebody cleverly added a second verse because they thought they were being cute. So they sang, my faith is working mightily for me. My faith is working mightily for me. No matter what the circumstances, what I feel or see, my faith is working mightily for me. Okay. Eh, okay. Kind of, I'll give you that, but you know what? What if it isn't? What if you don't think it is? What if you feel like a faith shipwreck? I don't think I need that verse because the word's got enough in it to produce enough faith in me that I don't even notice I'm having it. Abide in the wow, turn aside and see, and I guarantee you, it's impossible for you to hang out long term with the Logos. Notice I didn't say the law. Not The Logos is not the law. The law will never change the world. The law has no power. The law shuts things down. The Logos opens it up. Commit. Maybe, maybe there's somebody here. We're going to sing Dry Bones, I think. We're going to sing Come Alive, Dry Bones. Because, you know, there may be, I'm preaching in the Bible Belt of America, preaching to whoever's watching. You may have been raised under a lot of law. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Oh, can we please deliver the Bible from the notions of drivenness that we've endowed it with? You get to hang out with the Logos. And, you know, some of you might not need to open your Bible for days and days. Do you remember Cliff's testimony? God had him hang out in Psalm 23 for like a month. Why? Because that's where he was breathing. That's where the pal was. So, again, this is not about a printout of DNA and aren't we smart. This is about hanging out with reality which will then put you in touch, just like with Moses, with your own purpose, with your own meaning. Joey, could you please put that slide I alerted you about? There it is. Um, I just wanted to close with this slide. And I want to tell you, people say the Bible doesn't speak directly about science. You've come too late to tell me. There's a science of the spirit that transcends even... I'm, I respect science. I love science. Love it. But I love it because I see the hand of my Father God in it. And I just want to say this picture, even more than the other one, is your open invitation to worlds of meaning and truth for the next season of your life. So as we sing this song, Come Alive, I just want you to think about whatever dry bones you have inside you. Maybe they're dry bones of disappointment like Moses. Maybe you feel like you made a stab at the destiny you thought you had and ended up strewn across the battlefield. <laughs> or you might have a bunch of dry bones of religion where you felt yelled at, where you felt driven to, I don't know, go deeper in law in something you don't enjoy. I believe today, and Paul, you can go ahead and come and help me close here after this song. I believe today there's a breath, a wind, um, and an invitation. I guess what I love about the, that the most is you can go deep. Do you see that? An inv invitation to the depths of God. Don't be afraid. It's for everyone. It's not for some theologian somewhere. It's, it's not knowing concepts. It's knowing him. And he wants to manifest in your circumstances in ways that you haven't dreamed. Let's be gnarly. Let's, let's receive the wow and believe that there's going to be pals that come 
in the middle of all that. So, Paul, I guess Paul's going to come before we sing the song. We're going to sing the song. Is that what we're doing? Let's stand up together. Hallelujah. How many of you have eaten a steak before? Like, I grew up in Nebraska. Omaha steaks are my favorite. After eating a good steak, how many of you said, okay, I did that. I'm never going to eat another one. How many of you, like, want another one? Then, then why do we think that the Word of God fed us once and then, like, or one scripture fed us one time and, like, we got to move on to other ones? Right? Just keep going back because it's working for us. It's working in us. We just want to keep going back. I could eat steak every day. Why not? Why don't we? Let's do it. Hallelujah. Let's do it. Let's just keep going to the Word and just keep feeding on it, feeding on Him, and getting filled up with Him. What a good Word. Let's give Pastor Perianne a big hand. That's so, so good, stirring up our hearts. Let's lift our heart, and let's come alive, and let the Word come alive in us. for joining the Abbey service today. We are so thankful for you and we pray that this message blessed you this week. Don't stop here. Stay connected with us by liking us on Facebook and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Please see below for additional ways to receive updates and news as well as stay engaged with our Abbey community. You can also support the Abbey through giving on any of our platforms. We are grateful for your continued giving to help us reach people around the world and grow the kingdom through local and international missions. Thank you again for watching. We love you and God bless.